Welcome back to another episode of Ballroom Chat. I'm your host, Samantha, with Love Live Dance. If you've not already done so, please do make sure that you hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell for notifications so you know every single time we upload a new video. Today, I'm joined by Marissa Hamamoto. She is the creator behind Infinite Flow, an LA-based professional dance company who strives to make the dance world more diverse, inclusive, and equal. She also recently launched Scoops of Inclusion, which is a uh, school-based program that incorporates those same principles. Before we dive into today's conversation, I do just want to let you guys know that we do go pretty deep into some heavy topics. Um, so if you are not in a place where you want to hear about uh, sexual assault and rape, this might not be the podcast for you. But I thought it was very important to discuss those topics because through those challenges, through overcoming a lot in her personal life, she was able to create such an amazing program for the dance community and to bring others into the dance community. So I uh, just wanted to let you guys know up front kind of what you're getting into with this podcast episode today. But without further ado, let's go ahead and talk with Marissa Hamamoto. Well, thank you so much, Marissa, for being a guest on today's podcast. Thank you so much, Samantha, for having me. So um, for those that maybe are not familiar with you or with Infinite Flow, I want to talk a little bit about how you got into um, kind of the dancing world and what your background is with dancing and specifically with ballroom dance. Sure, absolutely. So I am a fourth generation Japanese American with, I was born between a third generation Japanese American father from Hawaii and a Japanese mother from Japan. Um, I mentioned these things because my Japanese American and Japanese cultural heritage has played a big role in my life throughout. Um, anyway, I was born in Japan. I grew up in Irvine, California uh, in the 80s and 90s. Um, Right now, Irvine has become very Asian, very diverse in, in many ways. Um, however, when I was growing up, uh, at least in the neighborhood I was in, um, uh, the school I went to, the elementary school I went to, I was one of the only Asians at that school. And um, uh, early on, uh, when I transferred from private school to public school, from first grade to second grade, my first month in second grade, I realized that I looked different and a lot of kids had a problem with it. So for example, um, I got made fun of for having Asian eyes. Um, uh, I would bring a Japanese bento box to school and then I would have a bunch of boys like you know, basically making fun of the fact that I was eating raw fish. I mean, if you think about it, like bringing a bento to elementary school is like, kind of like a luxury, I think today. but. Anyways, um, on the other hand, after school, um, my I was taking ballet classes. And in ballet class, I was also the only person of color. However, something about moving my body to music was this amazing feeling where even though I was the only person of color in that room, um, I felt like I fit in, like I felt like I belonged. And between the love of moving your body to music and just feeling like I belong, um, dance quickly became my passion. Um, I grew up uh, um, primarily in the ballet world and pursuing a professional ballet career while, while I was in, in while I was a teenager. I'll be really honest with you, I think even at that time, I don't think I even was exposed to ballroom at all. Like, I think I was exposed to ballet, jazz, tap, Broadway, but not ballroom. And I think my, I think if, if there was any ballroom that I was exposed to, I thought, oh, that's something that old people do. So I had this perception of ballroom as something totally like <laughs> different from what I see it today. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, in my uh, ball ballet was... When I was a teenager, I, I pursued a professional ballet career, but I really didn't fit the ballet mold. And I was told over and over that my body was not made for ballet. Um, and yeah, and I think my teachers were right. I really did not make it in the ballet world whatsoever. Um, in my late teens, I was raped 
by one of my ballet teachers who also didn't believe in me as a dancer. Uh, this is something that I've only been comfortable talking about in the last couple of years, but this incident or incidents um, really put a really big dent in inside of me. Um, just my, not just, it's, it's, it was a, it was kind of like this big scar that I've been carrying around my entire life. Um, anyways, uh, ballet didn't work out. I went to college in Japan, um, kind of went to Japan partly because I was interested, interested in my, my own culture. Um, uh, I was, um, also wanting to escape dance. So I moved to Japan, but what happened was where I found home and belonging was again in dance. So um, even though I was, you know, in the day, during the daytime in college, um, taking on a couple part-time jobs, um, you know, in the evenings, I would be at the dance studio, again, taking dance class. Um, uh, senior year in high in, in college, I thought I had it together. I thought, you know, academically I was doing well. I actually was freelancing as a contemporary dancer. I was I was feeling like I was finally able to start embracing my identity as a dancer. Um, and I said, okay, well, when I graduate, I want to just dance. I'm, I'm, let me go. Let me move to Europe, audition, and get going. Um, but in the middle of a contemporary dance class, uh, July 2006, um, I felt my elbows tingle, um, momentarily fell to the ground and found myself paralyzed from the neck down. And the next day I was diagnosed with something called spinal cord infarction, also known as spinal stroke, and was told by the doctor that I may never be able to walk or dance again. And Definitely, like up until that point, you know, I'm mean, not just up until that point, like just throughout my life, it's all, it, it's always been about fighting, about fighting to dance. Mm -hmm. And so here comes another fight, except when I did get that diagnosis, I thought the fight was done. I thought that this was the end of dance. And it was definitely um, a moment where I really did feel that my life was over. Mm -hmm. Um. Long story short, uh, um, long story short, I did walk out of the hospital after a couple months. I would say that um, I was a quote unquote miracle case. Um, and when I when I left the hospital, you know, physical paralysis had reduced. Um, my hands were still a little numb. To this day, I actually, my left hand is slightly paralyzed. My left side is a little bit, a little bit less. I feel less sensation on my left side than my right side, just altogether. So I always try to ask my doctors to um, poke a needle on my left side. <laughs> but anyways, putting that aside, um, I, uh, you know, even though I, I walked out of the hospital, I was still paralyzed on the inside, and just in a nutshell, um, during my hospital stay, it was this combination of feeling like my life was over because I can't dance anymore. But it was also a time where a lot of trauma had come back. So whether it was all the rejection from the dance, all the being made, made fun of for my heritage um, throughout school, um, or whether it was the sexual assault case from my ballet teacher, all these things really surfaced during the time that I was in the hospital. So when I left, it was like those things were still amplified. And on top of that, the doctor did say, we don't know how long your condition that you are in right now is going to last. You might get this thing again, who knows? And so being like left on this like limbo situation, which is the worst when you don't really have an answer. Um, I was scared that this whole episode was going to happen again. Um, because the incident also happened inside of a dance studio. Every time I saw like some kind of dance poster, dance advertisement, um, 
uh, anything, dance. And, and in Tokyo, it's like New York. You see posters of dancers all over the all over the city. So every time I see anything like that, I would literally black out. And one time, I did black out in the middle of a really busy street and literally just fell to the ground. Um, and so there was just, it was just, you know, I, I mean, at that time, I didn't know the word PTSD, but right. I look I look, I look at some of these blackout moments as well as having nightmares of the whole paralysis happening again. Um, what I went through was PTSD, except we're in a country called Japan in which you're not allowed to express your feelings and mental illness is taboo, um, even more there than here. So I didn't know to seek out, seek help. Um, anyways, fast forwarding um, three and a half years later, um, and this is where finally Baldwin <laughs> jumps into my life here. Um, three and a half years later, so this is 2000, late 2009. Um, what had happened between 2006 and 2009, I had finished my undergrad. I had gone to graduate school on a scholarship, um, not because I wanted to, but because it was the only thing I had. Um, in the sense that uh, I was told by the doctor by me not I, that I can't get on a plane. Mm. Um, so I couldn't go to Europe. I couldn't go to the States. I couldn't go anywhere. Um, I look back at the situation now. I'm grateful that I was able to go to grad school. And um, I, look, I look at it from a, now I look at it as, wow, you know, why was I not so grateful at that time? I mean, it was such a big privilege to be able to have a place to actually go. But anyways, either way, because I have been going through all this PTSD, um, it was a really tough time. And, but I got through grad school, finished in 2009. And it was getting through grad school was such a, um, it was such a, not, not a academic challenge, but an emotional challenge. I really did not want people to see me I didn't want to see anyone, so I got permission from the school to do, do school by not going to school physically. And anyway, so when I graduated, it was just this, this accomplishment that um, I was able to personally celebrate. So when that was done, I was like, okay, so what's next? You know, I was finally able to give permission to finally ask myself, what the heck do I really want to do in life? And what kept on coming back was I just want to dance. And, and that's all I wanted to do. But I'm like, you know, I can't go back to ballet. You know, it's not, it's just going to be like another big ass failure. Um, the whole contemporary dance thing was, um, was I just was having a hard time finding my place and also finding my voice. And um, on top of that, at least the contemporary dance that I knew back at that time involved a lot of rolling, rolling on the floor on your spine. And I'm like, you know what, that, that's not going to happen with the stroke I had. Yeah. So when I was in the, when in the middle of soul searching for all of this, um, uh, I, at, at a holiday, holiday party, uh, December, 2009, um, this was a corporate, just, just to kind of summarize what this was, this was a corporate holiday party, um, with, I don't know, probably about 100 attendees, all Japanese, 40s, 50s, 60s. I was definitely one of the younger ones in my 20s. Um, and in the middle of this party, there was this salsa couple that came on, performed. They were not great. <laughs> but afterward, they got everyone up onto the dance floor and said, all right, now it's your turn to dance. So what did they do? They taught the six-step salsa step basic, basic salsa, one, two, three, four, five, six, or one, two, three, five, six, seven, depending on where you're, where, what, what your syllabus <laughs> you're from. But anyway, they, they taught this six step basic and everyone followed and not everyone in the audience got it, but for the next 10 minutes, it was like just 10 minutes of pure joy and freedom from the audience. That's amazing. You don't understand that Japanese people are not the type of people to get up and make a fool out of themselves and just dance. They're, they're just not. We're just not. Even, even to this day, I'm not. I'm just not that. <laughs> but in this room, um, everybody was just dancing and just, just, it was just pure joy. 
and I was amongst, you know, one. Mm -hmm. And I looked around going, holy shit, this is dance. Yeah. Oh my gosh. For the last three and a half years, I've been, I've been contemplating how am I going to be able to dance again or being scared to dance. Yet here I am doing the six step basic salsa step um, amongst all these amateur, you know, drunk adults. And um, I was like, wow, this is dance. And yeah. in that moment, there's a part of me that's like, wow, why am I not the person do, like leading this, number one? Mm -hmm. and number two, I was like, okay, there is something for me here. I don't know what that is, but there is something for me here. So I went online, did my research, and I found a weekend salsa, kind of like three-hour like beginner class, mm -hmm. and I signed up for it. And going into this, um, I was very terrified, a couple of reasons. Uh, without going into the details, I had been sexually assaulted two more times after, after the stroke. So that's three. That's three, three times that I had been sexually assaulted by men. Um, and knowing that I have to now be in contact with someone and someone that I don't know, it was terrifying. So that was number one. Um, number two was, you know, I was really, I was, I was afraid that I was going to have these blackout moments again. Um, but I went in there saying, okay, if, if I can get through the first half of this with the non-partner work, it's a success. So let's just go. And if the partner stuff, it's just way too much and I'll just leave. And so anyway, I went, but I got through the entire three hours and I remember going out of there going, wow, what was that? That was fun. And something about, and I remember like, you know, learning the basics also holding someone else's hand and, and, you know, and these are like non-professional um, adults that, and half of them can barely have rhythm, you know, dancing arm in arm. And even though it was clunky, it felt comfortable. <laughs> something about this was felt natural. So when I, when I left, I was like, going, wow, this was amazing. And sometimes when you are like, you know, I realized, um, I look back and sometimes when you're fearful of something, it's actually that thing that you actually got to go and do. And that's exactly what happened that day. Um, I went back a couple more times and then, um, I got so addicted that I said, you know what? I'm going to make this my career. Now, at that time, I didn't know that there was salsa, tango, ballroom, all the partner dancing, at least on YouTube, all look the same. For me. <laughs> sure. And so, um, <laughs> and then, but once I saw a video of Joanna Lewis and Michael Malatowski doing International Roomba Basics, and actually, I looked back at that video, and it's actually off time completely, but at that time, I, I didn't know any of that. So anyway, when I saw this video, I was like, oh my God, I want to do this. And so somehow um, that led me to go, okay, I'm going to figure out how to make this happen. Long story short, I called up 50 or 50, about 40 or 50 dance ballroom dance studios in Tokyo and just asked to just be an apprentice. And like apprenticeships don't really happen at these studios. And they're like, huh, what the heck are you talking about? What, what do you have experience? And I'm like, um, I know a little bit of ballet. And anyways, it was just, Again, no after no, but I was just so adamant to find something that thankfully um, a couple of studios said, well, why don't you come over and try? And then I, one of them were like, no, you know, why don't you come and study? So they let me just, you know, train, get my teacher certification. Okay. So, oh, um, sorry. And then yeah. if you, if you want me to connect that to infinite flow. Um, so I moved to LA in 2012. Um, and then, uh, you know, 2014, I had hit a wall. Um, you know, if I were to summarize what happened here, uh, 2012, yeah, I, I moved to LA, you know, wanting to pursue the entertainment industry. But again, I, I was, I hit some walls again. And some of these walls, again, kind of came back to, um, not necessarily talent, but, you know, what I look like, mm. that I was Asian American. And on a number of counts, I was told that, oh, we don't need an Asian ballroom dancer. We don't need an Asian salsa dancer. 
Um, on top of that, if I were to connect this to the ballroom, ballroom dance industry, I'll be really, really frank and honest with you. I was never able to find a competitive dance partner. And I, um, yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, starting my starting a ballroom dance career at age 29, I believe, 28, 29 is probably a little late. Um, but I remember going on all these websites trying to find partners and a lot of dancers wouldn't even meet me because I had I didn't have any results. I do want to talk about and it can either be a conversation that's just between us or I can include it in the podcast. Um when you mentioned that you had that period between 2012 and 2014 where you kind of felt like you were hitting a wall. Um you know, I, I also came into ballroom late in my career. I don't have any titles to my name or, or anything like that. And I also don't have a professional partner that I'm working with. Um, I feel like the likelihood of finding a professional partner when you are an adult really comes down to who are you coaching with and what studio are you in? And if those two don't line up, the, the chances are like astronomical that you're actually going to find a partner. So I, I totally relate to that feeling of like, well, this is what I feel like I'm called to do. This is what I want to do. But the next step in this career path is to get a partner and I can't seem to find a partner. So now what in the world do I do? So I, I just wanted to share that, that, that is a, a, keep that in there, girl. <laughs> keep that in there. It's, you're not the only person that's going to resonate with that, you know. So that's two of us right here. So, yeah. 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 Um, so Infinite Flow comes in after um, returning to LA, becoming a performer and a teacher. Um, you mentioned that in previous interviews, I should say, you mentioned that Infinite Flow is really tied to your discovery of wheelchair dancing. Um, what about the way that wheelchair dancing is presented was kind of had that aha moment or that light bulb moment for you where you're like, this is something that I could get into. Yeah. Let, let me connect this all with ballroom yeah. just because I know that your audience, I'm not talking to a non ballroom audience where if I say a room, blah, blah, they're not going to understand what that is. Um, okay, so let me connect this to both ballroom dance technique as well as the world of ballroom. So, um, very similarly to you, um, I, well, let's just say when I first, when I first discovered ballroom dancing, or when I first discovered salsa dancing, if I go back to that class, I got to experience this really magical feeling of something about this six step salsa step, which is, which you repeat, you repeat the rhythm. This was something that didn't really exist in ballet. Okay, maybe you'll do like 32 changements, but never is it where you're on this rhythm and there's this cycle and and you know this appears in all of the dances waltz tingle fox you know cha-cha rumba whatever it might be and something about that was just very healing to me you know you gotta understand i'm a stroke survivor ptsd my body inside and out is just like a rock and this rhythmical exercise was just really emotionally healing spiritually healing physically healing. And so I got to really experience the benefits of this, I guess I'm just gonna call it partner dancing for now. On top of that, uh, you know, kind of speaking on behalf of myself being a sexual assault survivor where I really became terrified of human contact. Through the, the art of dancing in contact with someone, I was able to really like understand that, oh, having human to human contact is something that is natural and beautiful. And um, it doesn't have to always lead to sexual assault. You know, like by the time ballroom came into my life, um, I, I had never had like a real relationship and the only sexual experiences were 
sexual assault, basically, except for maybe one, but we're not going to go into that right now. Sure. Um, anyways, um, so then I entered the ballroom space with just really embracing the benefits of ballroom, if I were to put it in the terms. However, even in Japan, when I entered this world, it was this competitiveness. Um, it was about who's A class, who's C class, who's B class. It, it was about business. It was about money. It was about all these other things that I was initially not, didn't consider going into this field. Now, um, I honestly loved watching ballroom dance competition. It was fun. I mean, I didn't care about like scores or who goes where. I just loved seeing dancers just express themselves and just like really dive in. I mean, it was just really fun watching competition. So I've also went into the whole com com competition mindset as, oh, I just want to, I just want to um, get the best out of my own self, you know, whatever that is. But I, I didn't realize that so much competition was so, so much was placed on what class you are. And in Japan, you know, <laughs> I don't know how it is right now, but, and you know, I love Japan for many reasons, but at least with they, their dance sport world, it's like the male dancer mm. um, wears the class. It's, it's like, if you're, a, if you're an A-class male and if you're a C-class female, if you decide to dance together, guess what? The C-class female jumps to A, but let's say vice versa, you know? Let's say it's a C-class male, A-class, or like a formerly A-class female dancer. If they just start partnering, guess what? That female A-class dancer goes back to C, you know? And some of this stuff was just like not making sense from that perspective. Mm. Um, but ultimate, so that was like, I guess my time in Japan was kind of like this first um, entryway as to some of the things that I question about the ballroom world. Um, now, um, then when I moved to the States, um, I will say that I was actually really um, inspired by the fact that unlike Japan, um, in this country, social dancing was like the primary thing that people want to do. People don't like, people don't come to a dance studio saying, oh, I'm going to, I want to go to a competition. Right. You know, they go, you know what? I just want to be able to dance and, and be, go to the weddings and be able to dance with my grandkids and, and all this. I mean, it's, it's always about social. And, and so, and being, ex, you know, going from just knowing the international styles to the American styles, this mm -hmm. was also really, really, really like heart opening in the sense that the American dance style was so much more, so much more, it was so much better for social dancing. Like you can, you can, you can learn how to do a couple of Roomba, Roomba boxes and an underarm turn in one lesson. Yeah. And you can repeat that a hundred times social dancing. Like you can't do that with international stuff. So I will say that when I, you know, from a ballroom dance perspective, um, I was like, wow, I, I really love this. And I will say that one of my first professional dance partners, Esteban Conde, who I'm still good friends with to this day, um, he was a salsa dancer. And he, um, well, he exposed me to two things. One was salsa social dancing. And the other part was like building a, business from scratch I have to say shout out to him <laughs> you know but um anyways uh he introduced me he, he would be like you gotta just go out and dance with people just go and dance and like like this is not this is not textbook this is not le like selling lessons just go and dance with a bunch of people go to the clubs and so that's exactly what I did you know um and so for a while I my first year back here and I was working at working under Matt Brown, Lisa Cristiani. I love you both. I miss you both in case you listen to this. <laughs> um, you know, while kind of being exposed to the American ballroom dance studio at night, I would go and salsa dance. And this was an incredibly, incredibly um, time of discovery in the sense that, um, you know, I would get to these salsa clubs, you know, whether it was at Steven's Steakhouse or um, at, at the Granada. These are like just very like 
very, um, let's just say street salsa. I would mm -hmm. say 80% of the room is Hispanic. You don't hear much English. Everyone's just dancing. And again, I was brought back to this joy of dancing partnership. But also what I discovered through just dancing with so many people is that you start to find connection with like the, the people that you would least expect that finding a connection. I mean, one of the dancers, one of the dancers I love dancing with, I mean, he was probably about 30 years older than me, a head shorter than me, had really, really rough hands, didn't speak English. And I mean, but, you know, we just love dancing with together. Not only that, we would find each other going around to all these different salsa, salsa nights. And then we would just go through like five, six dances. And to this day, I don't know his name. And that's that's kind of like where I'm like, you know, I, after a while, I started asking mm. people's names. But anyway, this being exposed to Esteban's world of salsa and just salsa, the salsa kind of social dance scene, um, I will. I want to be really, really honest. I'll be really honest with you. I grew up in conservative Irvine, California. You know, when I was growing up, um, we had some issues with Hispanic gangs. So, from a diversity, equity, inclusion standpoint, I grew up with kind of having bias towards Latino, Latinas, Hispanics. Um, for the whole salsa thing where after a while I started making friends within people that were Hispanic. Through the dancing and that community, I was able to really embrace Latinos. And, and I'm also proud to say that when I was running a lot of salsa classes, over a third of my students were Latino. So and um, there's the, there's this power of dance where you you know beyond you, know, you get to kind of experience people beyond their labels. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Um, and and that kind of idea um, obviously is a staple of what you're doing with Infinite Flow and Scoops of Inclusion. But for um, listeners that are either studio owners or instructors that either have biases that they are aware of, or maybe that they are not yet aware of, but you're listening to this podcast or you listen to the episode with Tony Nunez and you're starting to take a look at who your clientele base is, who, who is taking lessons, who you're dancing with. And you're going, Hmm, there's an issue here. I should probably figure out a way to make it more inclusive and have a more diverse population that I'm working with is the first step just go out into a community that is not your own and find a social club or find a dance? Or is there another way from a business perspective that these studio owners and these dance instructors, myself included, can say, we know what it looks like, but our doors are open. Please come. We're, we're welcoming. We want you to be part of our dance community. Um, yeah, you're asking a really good question. Um, if I were to connect my experience of salsa social dancing to infinite flow for a moment before I answer your question. Yeah. Um, when I hit a wall, 2012, I moved to LA, got stuck. Um, to 2014, I hit rock bottom as an entertainer. You know, at that time I was pursuing, I was more so pursuing more the commercial dance industry. Um, and out came the words, when in doubt, focus out. Um, how can you make a difference with with the talents and experience you have right now. And that was when I accidentally discovered wheelchair dancing. One thing led to another. And soon I met Adelpho, who was a paraplegic bodybuilder uh, that lived about 30 miles away from me. He had zero dance experience, but I just randomly hit him up on Facebook saying, hey, this is who I am. I, and I, I mean, let, let me go back. When I initially discovered wheelchair dancing, I didn't know some, something like that existed. I was like, what? There's a way to dance without the use of your limbs? And having been a stroke survivor who couldn't move their limbs for, for a short period in my life, I was drawn to that. One thing led to another, led me to Adelpho. And I just, like, you know, as ballroom dancers, we're finding partners. I said, all right, well, let's just, let's just dance, you know? I mean, and I just hit him up on Facebook. We met a couple of days later and then I was terrified to dance with him and he had absolutely no idea what he was getting himself into. 
He didn't know how to camp music. He had zero experience. But after a couple hours of dancing with him, there was this magical moment where we're dancing arm in arm. You gotta understand, I had zero experience with, um, you know, this whole wheelchair dance in general. Um, and basically, there was this magical moment where I realized that dancing with Adelpha was nothing different from dancing with anyone else. And dance doesn't discriminate. And when you're dancing with someone, you see beyond race, color, size, age, gender, ability, and disability. And, you know, that discovery was such a big thing that night. Um, that night, all I can think of was, well, if the world danced, there wouldn't be war. And a few months later, that became infinite flow. That's my origin story of infinite flow. And to this day, I always remember that. Um, for me, I feel like if I were to talk to ballroom dance studios, you know, in the industry for a moment, I think the first step for any ballroom dance professional listening is really ask yourself, what is your purpose? Let's take away the competitions, the money, the, um, the titles. Let's take all of that out for a second. You yourself as a dancer and as a dance educator, dance instructor, dance coach, whatever you want to call yourself, why do you do what you do? Why? Is it because you want to share the love of dance to as many people as possible? You want to draw out the potential of people through dance. I mean, what is that? What is that why? What keeps you going? Like, you know, when you, when, you know, because I mean, this industry is not easy. In, the, in those moments where you're not, ha you're not, you're, you're not, you're not doing well, whether it's financially or physically or, you know, maybe dance title wise, whatever it is, what keeps you going? Like, and, and, and why, you know, if we're, if we're say as a dance educator, why do you, why do you want to share dance? You know, so really get clear on that purpose. And likely I have a feeling 90%, it, there's nothing about, nothing about people's identities that come in. There's nothing in there that says, oh, I'm going to only teach white able-bodied people, or I'm only going to teach, um, uh, heterosexual females. Like there's, there's probably none of those things that come in. You just want to probably spread dance in your own way. Um, and if that is your purpose, then, okay. Then now it's like, let's put the process into it. Um, and maybe the process is something that, you know, someone like me should you know, maybe you can approach me and I can teach you that process for people with disabilities. But I think the first step is really, really define your purpose. And, you know, if your purpose ends up being, oh, I only want to teach this type of people, just recognize it and ask yourself if that's good or bad. And if you think it's good, okay, then maybe you know, you can be in your own world and definitely don't call me. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, if, if your goal is to spread love through dance in however shape or form you can, then let's keep an open mind. Yeah. Um, I love that. I will say also with, um, with ball, you know, and, and with ball and dance studios, um, you know, I, I love the ball. I, I love ballroom dancing. Um, I will also admit um, that I did not do well in the business of ballroom. I had a very, very difficult time selling lessons at $120 per lesson. I had a very difficult time selling, you know, pro-am like packages at $1,500 plus however many dollars per entry. Um, I had a hard time doing that because I grew up on scholarships learning dance. And not that I, I think that, you know, we should just adopt the scholarship model. I mean, how, I mean we've got to make money in some way, shape or form. 
But for me, it was very difficult to say, oh no, you're not gonna be able to do that because you can't afford it. So I think one thing that just to really consider, and I don't have the answer to this, something I'm trying to try to answer myself, is um, in order to create access and equity, it's not just technique, it's also the business structure. You know, if your goal is to share love of dance to as many people as possible, how can you tweak your business model so that you can do that? Um, and I and I and I'll be really honest with you, I don't know what the answer. This is probably something a discussion that is that needs to happen amongst a hundred of us together. You know, mm -hmm. um, and then I will also say that. You know, at the same time, I will also say that um, I think what sometimes happens if we talk about disability is sometimes people with disabilities, let's just say wheelchair users, just because it's easy to visualize, it gets categorized as this separate thing within a studio instead of it being integrated. Now, there's, there's some challenges here. Part of it's the technique, and I'm also guilty of, of not quite figuring out how to integrate it all together. But I will say that, um, I will say that, uh, you know, in terms of our choreography, our performances, we've been able to integrate everything beautifully. Why? Not because I am a genius dancer, but because my heart is there. I just figure it out because that's what I want to see. That's what my dancers want to also just be in one pot. It's not like, oh, here's the wheelchair disabled people and then here are the non-disabled people. No, no, we just kind of put it together as one and we just figure it out. You know, we're all on the same page when it comes to this stuff. Um, so I think, um, I, I will say that I'm due for teacher training and that's something that I did want to launch this year before the pandemic happened. However, so some of this is definitely technique that just needs to be solidified. And I do feel like I, I have learned, discovered so much that it is my turn now to share. And I, I felt the confidence to be able to share that too. But I think more than technique, it's really about looking at your why and looking into your heart. And if you have excluded a group of people, whether it's social, economically, racially, um, disability-wise, LGBTQ-wise, and that's not who you are, then just sit with that for a moment. Sit with that. What does that mean? What, what, what kind of, what does that mean to you? Are you holding up to your values? Yes, no. And then naturally, if your heart is really there to be inclusive, you're going to figure it out. You're going to yeah. really figure it out. But you got to kind of sit there. And sometimes you got to like to, to sit there and sit with, sit with those, those kind of deep thoughts Sometimes it just means taking a pause. And honestly, during this pandemic, it's a great time to just kind of, kind of go, okay, let me rethink through this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I think, obviously, you made a lot of wonderf wonderful points in there and, and ask a lot of poignant questions of those of us that are in the industry to really take a critical look at why we are doing this, how we are doing this, and what the unintended consequences of how we have structured our business and the industry might be. Um, and I think you're right. I think there is a change on a grander scale that needs to happen within the industry, but it's going to take a lot of us coming together with a lot of voices at the table to make that happen. And hopefully having a lot of these small conversations will create a, a push from within the community to say, okay, now we need to sit down and we need to really figure this out because it's time. And enough of us are talking about it one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one within our own small communities that, that we do need to now make the next step towards change. Um, I know we are short on time today. There is a lot that I would like to get into um, as far as the PTSD that you brought up um, about just uh, how 
uh, influencers within the community can either support or dissuade people from dancing who truly feel passionate about dancing. We will save that for hopefully a future episode. Um, talk to me a little bit about Scoops of Inclusion, uh, what the new program is, how people can get involved, and um, just what kind of the, um, the mission statement behind it really comes from. Sure. So Scoops of Inclusion is a short film and learning platform celebrating diversity and empowering kids to become inclusive leaders. Um, this short film and project came out of the global pandemic. Um, I'm not going to preach to the choir. Dance industry, ballroom or not, has been shut down. Um, Infinite Flow is a professional dance company that uses dance, you know, that um, uses dance to promote inclusion and innovation. Um, I will say that I have stepped a foot away from the, the ballroom dance industry, though I, I still dance ballroom. But putting that aside, um, one of the things that we do as a company is we'll go to schools and for school assemblies. And um, uh, basically um, what happened was, um, school assemblies, well, let me go back. Three years ago, a Culver City school approached us for a school assembly. We didn't know what a school assembly was. They said, it's okay, just come in, dance and share your stories. That's what exactly what we did. And it became a very big hit. And sooner or later in the last uh, three years, we've gotten over a hundred inquiries. Um, yet I quickly found out that schools didn't have funds to bring us, even though we had really lowered our prices to the bare minimum, uh, schools didn't have funding. So last year, around this time in the fall, um, I had crowdfunded so that we can sponsor more school, school assemblies. And my dad passed three weeks into this whole thing, but, um, so the campaign kind of got cut short, but in the, during those three weeks, I got, we got ourselves onto Good Morning America, uh, raised a little bit of money. Um, we were about to hit, hit, we were about to go to a few schools, uh, but the pandemic hit, so all these assemblies got canceled. Um, during the summer, uh, I started to get some emails from schools saying, are you going to do virtual assemblies? And I said, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that. Um, but I really thought about it, and I really thought about everything that happened around, happened during the summer. And I will say that, you know, it doesn't matter what business you're in. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is more important than ever. And for me, if we can educate young minds, if they, if if young people, young people that are children, um, get exposed to inclusion at an early age, it stays with them their entire life. So, um, I said, all right, we're going to take our program online. So what I did was I took some of the crowdfunding money that we had, and I said, okay. Either we can save this, go back, go to schools in, in person, or we can create a short film and have this short film be accessible to all kids, families, schools, and basically anyone around the world at no cost. And I weighed the two options and I said, let's go with this, with um, creating an online you know, short film. That's what we did. Um, it was three months of every day, 16 to 18 hours. <laughs> um, the project kind of getting, get, got bigger and bigger, uh, but it's a beautiful film. And if I were to kind of um, go back to our conversation of, to the ballroom dance industry, th this film, you know, will touch hearts. And if you're having, if you're, if you're one of those people, like I have no idea what the heck Morris is talking about, diversity, inclusion, what the heck is that? Just go to scoopsofinclusion.org. You can find our film right there. Watch it, you know, you'll see, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of great dancing in there too. So it's not just a bunch of dialogue, um, but uh, this is, you know, I, and I'll save, save why we call it Scoops of Inclusion. It's, it's um, again, this is a program for kids, but, you know, we've had about, I think a total of, it's only been a couple of weeks since we premiered this, but I think we've had close to about 1500 people watch this so far. And the feedback that we've gotten, and this is like, I would say 70% are kids, 30% are adults, something around that. The feedback that we've gotten has been tremendous. You know, we hit many, many, many different 
nuggets of diversity yet or diversity and inclusion but it's like no this is for kids it's fun it's creative mm -hmm. it's uplifting um you, you know it's it's like i have kids in the cast um so anyways uh yes you know it's free <laughs> free you can make a donation if you want to but okay. um other than that um i would say uh I do feel I need to be more involved <laughs> with the ballroom dance industry. Let me admit that. I feel like I've strayed away from it because I will say that, um, I'll be really honest with you, Infinite Flow came out of a lot of trauma and some of that trauma was from the ballroom dance industry. Very similarly to you, um, Samantha, like, it, it was heartbreaking trying to find dance partners. And and it was, it sucked, you know, being told, oh, I don't even want to meet you for a tryout because you don't have any titles. And it's like, what the F is that, you know? Yeah. Like that whole thing. Um, I think there, I can count on a couple incidents where, you know, in a situation where someone just didn't want to partner an Asian girl. Um, you know, and, and, you know, and th this person had a lot of Asian students. And so for him, it just felt really odd to have an yeah. Asian professional dance partner, like just to some of the this discrimination that happens in the, in this industry. Um, when I got into more of the showbiz, it was a whole nother story in which, um, you know, I, I was met with a lot of ego, um, what met with a lot of just unwanting to practice, just doing the bare minimum to get paid and do a gig and all the gigs were basically coming from me. Um, and, you know, I, I will say that trying to find a dance partner to just regularly work with, um, I found it in wheelchair dancers, you know? So um, I think to, to save my own kind of, like, you can only focus on so much at a time. And for me, like, I didn't want to get too much caught up into the competition of dance sport. Sure. And to save myself from that, I did take a step away so that I can focus on providing access to dance. Because guess what? You know, there are many people who do not have access to dance. And for me, solving this problem is a lot more important to me than going out and winning a title. And, but now, um, you know, now that I've been doing this for five years and I've discovered so much and I've learned so much, um, I am finally, and I'm a lot more confident with what I'm doing. That's another thing. But I do feel like it's time for me to share. Um, and so I think after this pandemic is over, next year, 2021, I am planning on building our first kind of teacher training program. But all I will say with this is this, this is not just checking off boxes. This isn't just, okay, let's just learn the wheelchair dance syllabus, this and that. No, it's not. And it's not just about wheelchair dance, y'all. This is about like, creating equity and access to everyone, you know? And um, it's not just about learning a syllabus, checking off and doing it. It's really getting to the heart of what you do. And, um, and from inside out, creating spaces. Um, I think one of the things I'll say as a social entrepreneur is my goal is always systemic change, meaning that Meaning that it's not just about creating, putting band-aids. We want to really um, fix the problem of the system. Mm -hmm. And if, if I were to do that in a dance sense, it is where it is, it is about, and again, I don't know the answer to all this stuff, but there's a system that's been built within dance work, within ballroom. We've got to kind of, I don't want to say break it apart, but we've got to add to it to make it mm -hmm. more inclusive. I don't think Absolutely. it's necessary to always think, tear things apart. You know, I think sometimes it's just a matter of adding. Um, uh, and 
I will also say one more thing I'll say about all this is, you know, I'm a certain type of a entrepreneur, certain type of a dancer, certain type of an artist. And I do the way I do things the way I do it because that's what I believe in. And so my, my belief is always going to go towards inclusion, integration, um, instead of creating separation, instead of it, like if you're talking about like a, a dance studio, instead of having the disabled program, the non-disabled program, how can we put those two programs as just one program? That's where my brain goes. Um, I will say from talking with many people with disabilities that there is a benefit also to having groups where it's very specific. Spinal cord injury survivors who like to play um, rugby, whatever it might be. Sometimes these specific support groups are also important. So I definitely don't want to like neglect that either. But sure. I will say that, um, again, if we talk about purpose, the purpose of a dance studio, the purpose of a, of a dance educator, like look at that first mm -hmm. and ask yourself, are you really, really living up to that? Yeah. And if you're not, then guess what? You got some room to grow. And that's cool. That's yeah. super cool, you know, because, yeah, it sucks yeah. if, you know, you hit a wall and there's no room to grow. <laughs> so Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so, so, so much uh, for coming on and talking with us today. There are many more conversations to be had, so hopefully we can set up a future episode to bring you back on. But I, I think um, hopefully our listeners are taking a lot away from this episode and, uh, and just thank you so much for everything that you're doing working towards inclusivity, diversity, and equality. Cause I think that is, it is something that is a long time coming in the dance world and we need to see more of it. So thank you so much for being a guest. Thank you so much, Samantha, for having me. I'd like to give a massive thank you once again to Marissa for being a guest on today's episode. If you want to find out more about her, about how you can uh, follow Infinite Flow, or if you are interested in bringing scoops of inclusion to a school system near you, you can find those links in the description box below. I'm Samantha. I'm your host with Love Live Dance. You can find all of our podcast versions of these episodes at ballroomchat.com. And you can follow us across social media at Ballroom Chat on Instagram, Facebook, and very occasionally Twitter. Uh, if you have not already done so, please do make sure that you have hit the subscribe button. Maybe share it with a couple of friends and also hit that thumbs up button to tell us that you appreciated uh, episodes like this. And as always, stay safe, stay positive, and we hope to see you dancing very soon. Bye, guys.